So hello and welcome to Sam Patel course titled Trauma and Literature, where we're looking at Toni Morrison's novel Beloved. So we begin to wind up uh, a reading of this text and this will be the penultimate uh, session uh, for this novel. So in the previous session we stopped uh, where we're looking at the whole idea of uh, uh, touching red, so red as a touch. So we, you know, obviously the examination is the color of red and how that corresponds to different psychological states, different emotional states and, and obviously different trauma uh, traumatic states. Uh, so we'll just continue from that point and see how this issue, this theme gets played out across the novel. So this should be on your screen. A third instance of a combination of physical contact with red and an occurrence of voicelessness can be identified in Seth's behavior when she is stopped in the woodshed, right? So we were talking about voicelessness and how voicelessness is not so much a biological condition but more of a psychological experiential condition. You can't express what you want to uh, express, right? So you have the voice, the organic voice is there, but the agentic voice is missing and the missing, the absence of agency is what is being indicated by the concept of voicelessness. So there is a third instance where uh, the, uh, the convergence of the color red and voicelessness um, happens, uh, the scene near the woodshed. Clearly in shock, she cannot say a single word during the entire episode. She loses her voice as soon as she sees school teacher's hat coming towards her up the road. She does not call out, does not warn any of the other people present. Uh, and if she thought anything, it was no, 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 simple. She just flew. So we can see how there's almost a collapse of language, a collapse of communication. And this is a classic case of shock where the subject is so shocked, it's so much in a state of shudder that, you know, he just collapses and the communication collapses and there's no voice which emerges which can tell people what she is really feeling or we can seek help, right? So that, that quality is uh, very clearly there. She just flew, right? So uh, it's, a, it's a state of fright, it's a state of absolute shock, absolute panic, and it also, uh, you know, manifests itself in a collapse of, uh, you know, language, a crisis of language, a crisis of communication. Without a word, she grabs her children and runs to, to the woodshed to kill them. It is important to note here that Seti's silence throughout the entire scene is more than just an expression of being temporarily overwhelmed by the situation. So we can see how uh, she prefers to kill her children rather than uh, you know, subject them to slavery. So, you know, we can see how this novel is so bleak and depressing and tragic in so many levels. Uh, there is obviously the political landscape of slavery, uh, the racial, uh, you know, politics of domination, exploitation, and there's also the, uh, the element of infanticide. Children are being killed uh, to protect them, uh, perversely speaking, uh, paradoxically speaking, to protect them from the horrors of slavery. So, um, the scene creates a broad range of instances of voicelessness as it has several of the attendant characters at a loss of words at first. When school teacher and his nephew arrive, when nephews arrive, they notice that while a stampede is reduced to grunting, making low cat, cat noises like both he and baby socks are standing stock still, staring at the same place, a uh, shed. So the shed here becomes a symbolic uh, space, a symbolic site, and it's almost like the shed becomes a symbol of shedding the voice, or shedding the agency. So there is that symbolic quality, that liminal quality about the shed. So it's a very important scene uh, in the context of this novel, where the subjects shed their subjectivity, the subjects shed the agency and just, you know, get exploited, get consumed by trauma, by shock, and obviously by the politics of uh, exploitation and fear. Even school teacher's nephew is stunned at first upon seeing the carnage in the shed. So, however, the characters regain their voices uh, shortly afterwards. The nephew, uh, swallowing hard over and over again, finally verbalizes his um, incomprehension. Uh, what she wants to go and do that for? Baby Sucks tries to talk her daughter-in-law out of breastfeeding Denver while Sete is still covered in the baby's blood. Sete's silence is a more fundamental one as it lasts throughout the entire scene, even though a confrontation with the equally silent black community uh, until she is driven off to the jailhouse, right? So we, you can see it's a deeply disturbing scene. It's a scene of infanticide. It's murdering a child, you know, in a way to protect the child from slavery. And, you know, there are different forms of violence and abuse in all kinds of grotesque level happening over here. But the important thing over here is silence. How silence becomes uh, 
you know, a, a you know, reflective or state of shock, how silence becomes a voice, which is one of voicelessness, how silence becomes a form of embodiment, how silence becomes an activity. So all these different orders of silence converge together to create this complex uh, a soundscape, you know, in which the novel is uh, manifested, the trauma of the novel is manifested, along with the colors. So scholars have differed on their interpretations of this scene and set a silence regarding it, whereas uh, uh, Morgenstern interprets the fact that the reader never learns about what happened in the woodshed from Setter's point of view, instead of being uh, instead of being limited to an account through the eye of one of the other slave catchers, as proof that it is not the scene, or at least not the actual killing, that returns to haunt Sete. Lockyer's argument that this very fact remarks the scene as a core event seems more convincing. So, you know, focalization plays a very important wo uh, role in literary uh, depictions, as you all know. Uh, by focalization, obviously, we mean the uh, point of view uh, from which a story is seen or told or narrated. Now, we don't get to see uh, Setter's point of view, uh, you know, as some critics like Morgenstern point out. Uh, you know, the whole thing has been seen from the slave catcher's point of view. So it is barbaric, brutal, and it's obviously criminal how it happens. Uh, but there is that uh, other argument by Roger Lockhiss, who, sees, uh, who says that this is a core event uh, which informs the entire trauma and the traumatic reputation uh, in the novel. Right. Now, it is particularly in a refusal, in the novel's refusal, to even uh, once provide its readers with a narration of the event through Setter's eyes, that her trauma and inability to face it is signified. Right. So, the uh, absence of facing something that becomes the core quality of here. Uh, the refusal to face or confront the moment of trauma. Now, obviously, the scene in the woodshed as the central trauma of slavery to which the novel keeps returning is easily the one with the most intense red imagery. So the woodshed scene, as I mentioned, is a very important scene in the context of this novel. Uh, and obviously, it's full of the red imagery. Inside, two boys bled in the sawdust and dirt at the feet of a nigger woman holding the blood-soaked child. So you can see how the word nigger appears in the novel. Uh, obviously, it's done away with today, but in, a, in the context of its times, this is the gaze. Now, again, the gaze is important. The gaze is a white gaze. The gaze is a slave catcher's gaze. And they're looking at this black woman uh, holding a blood-soaked child, you know, someone that you know, she had presumably killed. Uh, at the moment of slavery's most shocking entrance, into the protagonist's world, so much blood has been spilled. The baby socks actually slipped in a red puddle and fell. Right, so this is the, you know, this is like a window scene in a novel where the slave catchers enter uh, the slave's world, and it's such a you know blood-stained world. It's full of the red blood. It's full of uh, you know, it's just it's got a dead child. It's just so gruesome and so grotesque, and so tragic at so many levels. And that's very deliberately done. So it, it becomes a microcosm of the. Uh, very bloody quality of slavery, in that it's always soaked in blood, it's always soaked in human death and violence and absence, and the grotesque quality of uh, slaughter. Now, this scene is the most vivid instance of the novel's portrayal of slavery, and the first stage in dealing with this trauma. Sete, who barely escaped the horrors of slavery alive, has been found by her owner, and decides that she would rather kill her daughter than have school teacher take her back into slavery which Pamela A. Barnett, applying Carus's uh, uh, terminology, has identified as sparing her children from the crisis of surviving the trauma of slavery. So, as I mentioned, this killing of the child is also, in a very perverse way, um, you know, emancipating the child or protecting the child from slavery. So, and this obviously becomes a reflection of the times, where the only way a parent can protect the child from being abused by someone else is by taking away the child's life. And that becomes the uh, core a trauma point in the novel, the killing of Beloved. And the whole novel is about Beloved, of course. Uh, but school teacher, ironically named school teacher, is a person who's a slave catcher, right? So he's someone who comes and you know, captures slaves and takes them back. And I know Sete had run away uh, from the clutches of such slavery, but now she's been hunted down and discovered. And she realizes that her children do have a similar fate awaiting them. So you know, she just uh, liberates the child by taking away her life.
So set, set is immediate reaction to the event is a state of complete voicelessness and passivity while she is literally soaked by red as a child pumped blood down Seta's dress. And she can feel the baby blood pump like oil in her hand. So it's just a disturbing scene. It's even difficult to read this, uh, the way it is projected and portrayed by Morrison. Uh, school teacher's intrusion and the infanticide she commits as a reaction causes a trauma or cause a trauma so fundamental to her psyche in the sete and thus a novel cannot help but keep circling back to it in perfect definition of compulsive reputation. So as I mentioned, uh, this novel has a very solid classical uh, Freudian quality to it. This entire repetitive quality of trauma, how this moment keeps coming back and keeps haunting the mind of sete is how the novel is informed and shaped. It leaves her imprisoned for her de deed, not physically but mentally unable to create an ongoing life for herself. Uh, Lockhurst notes that in her attempts to talk about the event years later, while actually walking around Paul Dean, set his account as one of avoidance, delay and evasion, which is played out uh, through the agitated movements of her body uh, as much as through language. Now, we, we talked about this in the previous session, how evasion and denial and deferral, all these become strategies of, uh, you know, miscommunication. And that is important over here because um, this is an even, this is a, um, you know, experience which cannot be communicated, which is outside the realm of normal, normative communication. That's a very ontology of trauma, that's the very location of trauma outside the normative category of language. So all these strategies of avoidance, delay, and evasion, uh, these actually become strategies that inform the traumatic uh, language, the traumatic landscape. So that just, uh, these uh, tropes keep getting informed or keep getting, uh, you know, keep appearing throughout the novel as recursive uh, rituals of communication and the absence of it. Now, Kathleen Brogan has identified Seta's explanation uh, that she took and put my babies where they'd be safe to be an outrageous uh, euphemism to an auditor, but literal truth to Seti. She speaks a language Baldi does not share, a drawing on a vocabulary wrenched from ordinary meanings. This description once again highlights the difficulties involved in narrating a traumatic event, which is by definition outside of ordinary language. Uh, so this is what we're talking about, how the experience of trauma is outside the normal experience, how the language of trauma is outside the normal language, and this outside quality, which uh, you know translates roughly into what Freud calls the uncanny. Uh, if you look at the uh, etymology of the word uncanny in German, unheimlich, which is outside the home, so there is an outside quality. Uh, so trauma, by definition, has an uncanny quality, and that uncanniness uh, or the outsidedness uh, of trauma is exactly what we see in this novel as well. So thus it bespeaks the character's need as well as the novel's choice to use troping in expressing uh, trauma. Right, uh, so troping becomes um, uh, an interesting uh, category in the novel in terms of how the figurative description of trauma becomes more important and perhaps more authentic than any literal description of trauma can ever be. Now, just wrapping up the session today, this section of a repressing red uh, is something that we talked about earlier as well how repression and absence become very important categories of communication uh, in uh, Beloved. So, so a second step uh, in which Beloved's characters process the wounds of slavery is a repression of his horror. So not talking about it, not experiencing it, it's repressing it in the psyche. The novel endows both Paul D. and Sethe with powerful red images of traumas of slavery. In these instances, which serve as a transitional stage, between the state of shock and the beginning of successfully dealing with the trauma, the novel turns the concrete and physical appearances of red into figurative elements, tropes, as it were, portraying the internalization and the repression of slavery's cruelties. Now, what this means is, in a novel like this, Beloved by Toni Morrison, uh, the difference between matter and metaphor become quite, uh, becomes quite slippery. So the figurative language and literal language, they keep converging with each other. Uh, and that is the uh, trope-like quality that this language, this linguistic register happens to have, happens to generate. Uh, 
Now, the most conspicuous example of the use of the color red in Beloved is in relation to repression is Seti's contact with a pink tombstone against which she leans in the engraver's workshop and which is explicitly denoted as a lighter shade of red in her description of the fading color progression uh, starting with the baby's blood, right? So and we can see how the different shades of red becomes important, become important from pink to red, uh, red and you know, from baby's blood to the blood of slavery, how they all get connected in the same bloodstream, right? And in, in a very biological sense, uh, it almost generates a perverse sense of kinship. Uh, they all, um, they have, they're the blood kins, they're blood relatives, right? And that, that kinship can only be established by the violence which is manifested by the blood or the loss of blood. Now, this image certainly appears uh, similar to the ones described above as an occurrence of physical contact with the color red. So, you know, the, the scene in which Sete is sexually attacked by the engraver while leaning against a tombstone, feeling its welcoming cool. So, you know, the coolness of the tombstone, which is the deadness of the tombstone, that becomes more welcoming than the sexual act that she has been subjected to brutally. Now, there is even an instance of voicelessness or a lack of words in that Sete has to prostitute herself to the engraver uh, so the engraver will put her daughter's name on the stone. In fact, it pains Sete. So we, we talked about this bit uh, earlier, uh, and I'm just going back to it and connecting it to the uh, quality of repression uh, that we just mentioned. How the idea of being attacked in a tombstone, uh, this image which we discussed earlier, how if we go back to the end of the essay, and we were talking about how the redness gets manifested as a psychological condition, but also as some kind of a protective condition, right? So that shed scene which we just discussed. Uh, where the liminality of the shed scene, where the subject is shedding uh, uh, her agency, shedding her voice. And if you go back and reread what we did before in this Tombstone episode, where here again we have a sense of shedding uh, agency, shedding dignity, shedding the body, right? So the Tombstone too uh, becomes a site, a symbolic site, where the agency of the subject is shed, right? And, and what we have over here is a brutal scene of sexual assault, sexual attack. And you know the, subs the subsequent sessions are something we discussed already in terms of how she needs to get words engraved on the stone, right? So we can see how there's a very direct and organic relationship between words as they engraved uh, on the stone and bodily violence and voicelessness. So we can see as a conclusion to the session, we can see how uh, the liminality of different sites and the uh, the blood imagery which are there throughout the novel are connected. And as was mentioning, uh, how the voicelessness uh, is informing the appearance of words on a tombstone. So the engraving of words, dearly, uh, you know, beloved, the names which are supposed to appear on the tombstone can only emerge out of the voicelessness to which a subject, you know, offers itself for sexual assault, for violence, for bodily and corporeal violence. So I'll stop at this point today and we'll conclude with this uh, novel in a subsequent session. Thank you for your attention.